So, good evening, everyone. I've been really looking forward to this show. This is Paul Woodhatch here for World War II TV in the first of our two header World War II comic shows. And I'm starting with an absolutely stellar lineup for this first show. Um, I won't go through massive introductions. You know who they are. You've read the YouTube, but Garth Ennis in New York, Billy Tucci, and Ferg Handley. So, that's all, all the genre of World War II comics covered there the kind of graphic novels, and American and British, and uh, just an amazing lineup. Good evening, afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure. No problem. Thanks for so, having us, Paul. Well, yeah, no, th well, I say thanks for coming along. So World War II comics, I mean, my whole contention is the reason I got this idea from Stuart Lee, the British English comedian, about, about how important comics were. You know, and we look at we look at war movies and there's serious studies of military history and war, World War II comics, I think, are as important as these other mediums for getting across history it's just a different a different medium so let's go around we'll start with garth because he's in my screen first just where did your influence come from in terms of when you were growing up what were you looking at in terms of comics and history and war films what were your what were your big influences uh, well comics most obviously battle uh or battle action as it was known when i was first reading it commando the picture libraries um, in terms of movies, it was probably the, the kind of great cast of thousands movies of the 60s and 70s, like A Bridge Too Far, Battle of Britain, um, Great Escape, Longest Day. The things where yeah. every actor they had would come on and do five minutes and they would cut together an entire, uh, an entire movie out of it. And in terms of um, actual military history, well, when you're a kid, you're not really thinking in particularly cohesive terms. So it would be interesting memoirs um, by some of the major figures or things that they'd written. I can remember reading books by people like Adolf Galland and Douglas Bader and Johnny Johnson, um, their memoirs. You, as, as a kid, of course, you, you don't really tend to read military history all that carefully. It tends to be, you know, the big book of tanks, the big book of airplanes, mm -hmm. stuff like that. But if your interest lasts long enough, you will graduate to, to something better. Uh, to, and eventually, of course, if you can end up doing your own war comics, that will all, that will all play into it. Absolutely. And I think that's the thing or the point I'm going to try and make in this show is that so many of my contemporaries, James Holland, Peter Caddick, Adams, all the guys who write books, they, they will all admit that it was comics that got them started on it. And then, as you say, Garth, some of them kind of progressed on to, to more in-depth, you know, your Max Hastings and uh, those kind of people. But let's 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 turn to, to Billy over in the States. You were obviously different countries, slightly different influences. But you, growing up, what were your big um, your big things? You know, I got to say, um, uh Definitely, you know, our army at war, the DC, great DC books, you know, Sergeant Rock. My first comic that I remember getting or really valuing was uh, the Sergeant Rock number 278. And I still have it. Um, it was it was given to me by a friend of mine. It was all door geared and chopped up and everything. And it just blew my mind. I mean, Joe Kubert is is just he's my comic god, you know, and um, but aside from that, it, you know, all the ones, you know, Haunted Tank, you know, uh, Weird War Tales. Uh, even I got into, I mean, uh, Garth wrote a, the great, you know, uh, Sergeant Fury stuff. Um, I, I tended to, I, I, I skewed more towards the DC comics uh, as opposed to like, so, you know, Sergeant Fury and the Highland Commandos, because that was kind of, you know, more Marvel style. Uh, but then again, those films too, you know, the same thing with the books, that big giant heritage book of World War II. Uh, it's, it's massive. I got, I got a whole, it's got to be here. I got an entire bookshelf of World War II stuff, but. And then, of course, John Wayne movies, you know, San Diego, Jima, things like that. You just, as a kid, you just gravitate towards it. And, uh, you know, like as Garth had said, those movies, like, you know, Bridge Too Far. I remember when that came out, I got the, the movie book and, and all about it. And it was uh, just something that really hit me with that, with, you know, especially with the Airborne, that I ended up, you know, joining the service myself and going mm -hmm. Airborne and all. And I just wanted, you know, I wanted that red beret and those jump boots, I guess, you know, because I just thought they looked great, especially the British paras in, in the bridge too far. And then you realize, you know, when you get older, wow, we wear we wear berets too. All right. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's definitely that same as, as the kids. And as Garth says, you get the books out of the library and then you ask for them, you know, for Christmas or something like that. And the more you learn and then you become a real student of it, you know, a bit of a novice one. But you just uh, you, 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 you don't love war. No one does. But 
you learn to appreciate it, especially the sacrifice of, of those who had to fight it. Mm. And, uh, and, and Ferg, we'll, we'll, we'll bring some of those themes up of sacrifice and, and, and war not being glorious later on. But Ferg, what were your influences growing up? Well, like Arthur, it was, um, you know, British war comics like Commando, the picture libraries. Um, not so much battle. I think that was out after I sort of started graduating into other got comics and teenage life and things like that. Um, Victor enjoyed reading there. Uh, to a certain degree. Um, and yeah, like like Garth, the big movies, uh, ones he mentioned, but also ones like, you know, The Blue Max, Lawrence of Arabia, and the well, all the black and white ones are about Dunkirk, the cruel sea, that type of thing. Um, and being a kid growing up in Britain, uh, born in 1963, so, you know, up to the early 70s, Lots of toys involved, you know, ethics, mm. kids playing with soldiers, recreating little battle scenes, things like that. Uh, um, a certain amount of TV shows as well. Um, Combat, which is an American series, I always remember watching that on a Friday night. I found that quite enjoyable. Um, Dad's Army. Oh, yeah. It was yeah. a comedy. There was a lot in that. And uh, there was something that always fascinated me about the end credit scenes when they were actually, I know it's probably an exercise looking back on it, but they were actually going through... Um, do explosions with camouflage on and things like that. It always piqued me interest that that um, part. And uh, well, finally, um, I was a voracious reader when, when I was a kid. Um, then I got, got up a council estate. We were the first people in the blocks. There was no other kids about, so I just used to read a lot, basically. <laughs> uh, I'd read all the kids' books, so they said, look, you can have an adult ticket as long as we um, approve it sort of thing. And one of the first ones I grabbed was a book on the German Spring Offensive in 1918. And I can still see those ghostly images of pillboxes and soldiers with uh, gas masks on and things like that. I found it very haunting. And that, for some reason, I sort of stuck in my mind that book. And I think that might have triggered something in me at an early age. I mean, brilliant stuff. And, and imagery is something I really want to bring up later on because that there's something you, can, you as writers and creators of comics can do with a, the comic format that even the movie makers can't do. You, if you want to have a forty battleship <coughs> battle, you can stage that in a comic that the movies can't do. You can, you can put your protagonist in it, it whatever kind of scale you want to do. But um, I don't want to go perhaps necessarily how you got into doing war comics because we, we, people can read your biographies on Wikipedia, what have you. But I want to know about when you're tackling it because you all are known for World War Two, but also other subjects, Billy, with your your she series and you know you've written for all sorts of you know, the other the other fantasy realms all well perhaps not ferg when you're tackling something about real history so you're you're tackling a story about let's say stalingrad because we happen to mention that before going live or battle of britain do you approach that writing process differently than when you're doing something set in a fantasy universe is the writing process the same or, or do you have to have different ways of doing it uh either either, either billy or garth jump in there garth I like listening to Garth, so. <laughs> well, um, very obviously, of course, uh, the difference between fanta these fantasy genres like uh, superheroes or sword and sorcery or um, science fiction or even horror is that you can basically make up anything you want. And so long as it works within the context of the story, you can get away with it. With uh, war, perhaps more than any other genre, you do have to do the research and you do have to get you do have to do, get the details right. And to go back to what we were talking about very briefly about growing up with this stuff, you realize at a certain point as a kid that unlike the other genres I've mentioned, and perhaps with the exception of all others, except maybe crime, uh, war, the war stories you're reading in your comics or, or watching on, on your film, in your movies, these are based on reality. People did these things. Um, you can you can read um, a, an exciting comic strip about a dog fight in the Battle of Britain, but, and you can watch the old movie with Michael Caine and so on. But then you realize that this actually happened, that great aerial fleets did meet over the south of England in 1940, and they did decide the course of the war, um, that everything hung on those, those two or three months. And I think it is that understanding that either turns you off a genre like war comics or draws you to it mm. if it draws you to it you realize that part and parcel of that is getting the details right is paying due respect to the participants and the events 
by making sure as far as possible that through your research, you're going to get all those details right. And that's something that's perhaps more important in historical drama, historical fiction and war comics in particular than anything else. Yeah. I mean, we, I've, had, I've had people who are involved in war movies on and the public will hold war films to a standard of accuracy beyond right. they would with westerns beyond they would with science fiction and that's right that's only should because we all you know of our age group we all have the fathers the uncles the grandfathers who fought we all had the neighbors who fought we all met people so we should we should be held to a high standard to keep yeah. it right and yet and this kind of leads into my i mean how i know that you know ferg and, and billy you haven't spoken yet but my next question will be you know the um balancing telling a good story and keeping it real because that's, you know, I, I've been rereading comics. It's been such fun researching for this because I've just got to read comics for two weeks, two weeks. Sometimes I have to read big 600 page military, and I enjoy that, but it's just been really good reading comics for a couple of weeks and feeling like it's actually part of actual work. It's really good. But, you know, I was rereading Garth, you did the introduction to the battle, the, the, the HMS Nightshade series, which was brilliant about the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, uh, and yeah, they were sinking new boats to a page you know stuka's being shot down five five an issue which clearly is kind of taking things to a kind of a historical exaggeration yet all grounded in this absolute reality of the fact that the battle of the atlantic was this very long prolonged campaign with lots of suffering mm -hmm. but so billy we'll bring you in because and then and then fur but you know that the responsibility when you're doing World War II, because you because you, you and i had a shared friend uh, we were both friends with don burgett a company 506 parachute yeah. veteran d-day all the way through wrote the classic quartet of books starting with kurahi and ending up with you know and seven roads to hell just i mean it wasn't he an amazing guy billy and if you're with someone like that you have to get it right so you know when you were doing your sergeant rock and lost battalion you know you, you've got a duty to get it right and how, how do you take that responsibility on well, you know, I, I again, I'm a I'm a, re, uh, a a reference nut and a research fanatic. I think I should have probably been a research librarian or something, because, you know, when you get into that rabbit hole and you just go down and you just learn more and more. But um, with with the Sergeant Rock book, um, it became a lot of that was by the direction of D.C. because they wanted it to be more of a um, of a documentary almost because they knew so many of the veterans were involved in it because they were at that time still veterans of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the Japanese Americans still alive and still with us. And um, they were, uh, you know, consultants on it. We had an introduction by one of the, one of the members of the 141st who was, who was uh, a part of the Lost Battalion who was trapped with them, who was the radio operator that was up there with them. And then Jimmy Yamashita did the, the, the afterward, who was part of the 442 that had to go and rescue them. Um, in, our, in our little, in our comic, in, in Sergeant Rock, the Lost Battalion, it's the story of um, the 141st Infantry, 1st Battalion, it was 274 men were part of this operation called Operation Dogface, which was an assault into the Vosges Mountains. Problem was, was that the Germans had gotten plans to, to Operation Dogface a few days before, and they were waiting for them, and they cut off this, this you know, partial battalion of 274 men and they held out for six days um, against 4,000, I think it was 4,000 Gebergsjägers, you know, German mountain troops. And, uh, and um, <clears throat> well, there was they, then playing with the little things, you know, there was a, there, there was a, uh, uh, a Panzer IV in it. And uh, I made it a tiger. Cause why not every, you know, every, every U S soldier you talk to who, who encountered a German tank, whether it be a Stug three or, 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 a, you know, a, uh, anything you know they always end up being tigers so always i made a it a tiger yeah you know but uh but no that was a, like dc wanted to be and there was a lot of exposition in it but the veterans really liked that you know and i didn't mind doing it because i'm like wow okay I, I love adding all this stuff but they wanted it to be like harking back to the early robert Kaniger stuff when he first introduced war comics uh to you know to the masses with sergeant rock and our army at war where you see the guy running and it says you know and i gathered a grenade you know, ready to throw the grenade into the pillbox. And you, you see him doing that. You know, you're illustrated. And I would talk to him like my editor. I'm like, well, I'm drawing him doing that. I don't have to write it too. You know, I, they see he's throwing a hand grenade. So why do I have to write that? Why do you want that little narrative in there? And he said, oh, that, well, that's how the old war books were. That's what we want. I'm like, okay. You know, it was, it was fun, I guess. <laughs> um, but, uh, but the people that don't read comics got it, it, it you know, appreciated it because we wanted to really respect 
you know, the fighting men on both sides of, of you know, the Germans and the Americans during the battle. Um, but, you know, getting down to reference and things like that, and I might be jumping ahead of myself a bit, but uh, I wanted it really to be attuned to what the Germans were wearing, all, all the Germans of, of that, that particular battle, down to their ribbons, down to the, to, the, to the particular uniforms, to the types of uniforms they wore. And the same thing with the Americans, that you had the 36th Infantry Division came up, you know, through Italy, and a lot of them, you know, who fought through Africa, you know, the, those divisions and all, they, by come late 1944 into 1945, they were still wearing the M1941 pattern uniforms with the leggings and the combat shoes because they had shipped so much stuff through Africa and Italy, they weren't getting the new M1943 patterns that, say, the troops that came in through Normandy War later on. So mm. they were still using this outdated stuff with the haversacks. They didn't have musette bags for the most part. You know, officers did. But, uh, but I wanted to throw that in there. That's why I wanted to, I, I drew them with leggings and things like that. You know, why, why aren't they wearing double buckle boots? Well, some of them are, you know, but the majority of them, like Rock was wearing double buckle boots because he came back from the repo depot after getting wounded. And that's why he was, you know, he came back in. But a lot of the other guys, Wild Man, you know, Bulldozer, a little short shot, they still had the old and, you know, the M1941 pattern uniform. And, and people got that. They, they enjoyed it. They seemed to, to dig it. So, but yeah. that, I mean, that's, I mean, we'll bring Ferg in, but that's the fascinating thing is that by putting those details in, I'm not going to, 90% of your readers aren't going to notice that detail, but the 10% who do will really, really care. And they'll yeah. be really, my God, that. And, and Garth and Ferg, you can perhaps jump in on that as well. I mean, when you're putting details in, there's you're aiming at a, a niche part of it so i mean before you haven't spoken for a while i mean you're the author of how you couldn't even remember over 300 commando comics i mean just staggering amount of work just tell her about the how you're balancing storytelling historical accuracy trying something new it, it you know how where the ideas come from how do you balance all that well most of my most of my stories will get a usually get a germ of an idea and it's straight to the research stage and uh, I, can, I can get really mat meticulous on that ridiculously so a lot of it doesn't even come into the story but it makes you feel in control when you're writing it and it seems to add an authority to it like recently I wrote a commando book about a German air flat gun crew fighting out in Russia and uh, on the internet I actually managed to find it was about a 90 page manual from World War II on how to operate an 88 millimeter gun. Um, so I was able to supply, you know, for each um, scene that was used in whoever was doing what I was able to supply all these images and, um, and facts to the, to the artists and what have you. Uh, but when it comes to actual scripting of it, I'll say a lot of it doesn't make it in there, in there but you know that what you're putting in is, in, is correct. And uh, that's, that's it's always been very important to me. In fact, when I first started writing Commando, um, there was a lot of people working in the office and they do a lot of the research for you. Um, so you could write the script and they damn put in the accuracies if, if needed. Um, it's a lot smaller department now. And uh, after a while of working at C Commando, I started doing real life war stuff, um, for example, the Imperial War Museum or Help for Heroes, things like that, based on real life soldiers. So the amount of research I had to do that, do for that, it was well, almost ridiculous. Um, unfortunately, I've now gained a habit of doing that level of research for um, just about any, anything I do, because um, part of the experience is it's, I enjoy learning. Yeah, um, and, you know it's a good vehicle. You know if you if you're picking up a book, invest in time in it. There's also a chance you might get a payoff at the end of it as well. Mm. I mean that that's that ties in with me being a tour guide. And you know, most of what I'm doing in Normandy is taking people to the same five or six places again. They go well, not this year because of COVID. You know, Sam Wrigley's Point to Hop, blah blah blah. But most of the guides here have a knowledge way beyond of that that we don't tap into most days because you're telling the same stories. But it's good to have the knowledge there because if you do get asked that question. So where did this unit go on to in July? And you go, ah, oh, well, they went off towards San Lo and they fought on the so-and-so campaign there. So, you know, I mean, it's that it, having knowledge is a good thing. So, you know, Garth, I mean, you, you're, you're, you're from a, uh, well, someone described you as the Quentin Tarantino of World War II comic writers, which I, <laughs> I hope you take as a compliment. I, I think it's a really, if I was compared to Quentin Tarantino, I'd take it as a compliment. Um, gritty and you know language and lots of blood and guts and stuff and yet inherently inherently kind of based in reality and so how do you approach that 
you know, you've got a history, historical subject you want to write about, and then you've got to make it into an interesting story for mm. an audience. How does that process go, go through for you? Uh, well, I, sh I should say, I certainly never mind being compared to Tarantino. I, I don't know anyone else who communicates the sheer, sheer joy of storytelling quite the way he does. I mean, the, the man seems to radiate the glee of what he's doing. Um, as to... <clears throat> As to your question, um, it's it's the old idea of balancing um, an exciting character-driven or narrative-driven story with historical reality. And you, once you've decided on the kind of story you want to tell and what your subject matter is going to be, you you start to think in terms of making it as interesting as possible for people. And my way of doing that is usually through character. Um, and what that means is giving the audience characters that they can relate to or sympathize with and then moving them through the story. Um, and sometimes, sometimes you have to tweak reality a little bit to make it work for you. Uh, an example, I, I had a graphic novel come out this year called The String Bags with uh, PJ Holden on the art. And that was the story of the fairy swordfish cruise. Uh, wow. British torpedo bomber crews of World War II, and I wanted to um, I wanted to get across uh, the the essential notion of this antiquated biplane torpedo bomber in very in the very dangerous skies of World War II, populated by modern anti aircraft and uh, monoplane fighters. Um, and what I chose to do was to to pick the three most famous uh, instances of the swordfish's story, which were Taranto, the yeah. hunt of the Bismarck, and the Channel Dash, and combine them into one narrative, follow one swordfish crew through all three. And the reason I chose to do that was I thought that these, these events are so big and so epic that they will overwhelm the story. They will just turn it into a documentary a very dry documentary, unless I give the audience characters that they can they can sympathize with and follow through. And the problem there is that no one three-man swordfish crew went through all three of those battles. In fact, I don't think even one crew went through two. Wow. So the obvious answer was to create three fictional characters in my crew and with a little bit of historical sleight of hand, move them between the three battles, have them transferred, have them get shot down and picked up by a ship that was not part of their original task force, uh, have someone lose the paperwork down the back of a filing cabinet, anything to keep these, to keep these three characters in the places I wanted them I wanted them to go and uh, just just to finish up as briefly as possible the way i saw it is this was fair enough so long as i didn't portray my three guys my fictional crew as having be having done anything decisive so mm. they would they would take part but they wouldn't they wouldn't launch a torpedo that that sank one of the italian battleships at Taranto. they wouldn't be the crew that got the torpedo into the bismarck steering gear and effectively decided her fate they would be there they would be part of the attack but they wouldn't decide anything and I thought that was fair enough and it seemed to work okay because I was able to tell the story highlight the achievements of the the real life crews but at the same time keep the audience interested enough in the characters I'd given them to move them right through the story. I mean, that sounds perfect to me. I mean, I, I'm going to go straight on Amazon and order that any moment now. But um, that balance thing of it, because ultimately, I know even with doing these YouTube shows, I, shows I do, that if I have a historian on talking about their book, there'll be certain people who will watch this show who won't go and buy the book because they're not book buyers. And so, you know, when you're doing World War II comics, that there are people reading comics who perhaps won't go on and buy a thousand page history by Peter Caddick Adams about the Battle of the Bulge. And so you've got an opportunity, all three of you, to get people on the road to those books through your books and they kind of go hand in hand, just like military historians can watch the Battle of the Bulge or Cross of Iron and get something out of that, even though they know there's elements of fiction and what have you involved, it's still okay. And, and Billy, you know, you know, with your with your Lost Battalion and, and, and the Don Baguette thing, you know, you, you did the covers for Don Baguette's family's last reissue of their books, which was, and I'll put that up on screen in a minute, which again, you took a bit of license there because you took a filthy 13 image with the war paint 
I put it up on the screen there yeah. and it kind of shifted a bit. But, you know, anyone who knows their US Airborne kit will recognize that that is a perfect representation for a D-Day jumper, isn't it? You know, that there's, there's nothing in there out of place. All the details are there. And, you know, that, that's to your credit that you take that care. Um, yeah, so yeah, yeah. The thing was, is, is, is you know, Don, it, 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 I look at him like, a, like, a, you know, I, I guess I'm the, ado- I, I'm the grandson he never wanted um, <laughs> or asked for, you know. Well, then I that mean, means I, you and I are brothers then because. Yeah, I- <laughs> yeah I, I love that man. I love his whole family. And uh, when they put that together, that the, the, Renee approached me and Don that they wanted to do the book, they wanted to get the first issue out soon, you know, and I didn't have art for it. And he wanted to do something with D-Day. And I'm like, well, I had this illustration I had done. Uh, I was also friends with Jake McNeese, um, Jack Agnew yeah. from the Filthy 13. And, um, and I had done it and I said, well, I can do it. In, I can give you the black and white version and we could just wipe out the war paint. Um, on it and they're like yeah because they wanted to use it for the advertising and all get and then later on i i was able to recreate uh various uh um aspects of 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 the books for each particular one like for seven roads of hell and for the road to arnhem you know i was able to to, to use you know image you know bits and pieces from the book for for episode, episodes of that and speaking of the 88 it's uh for the road to arnhem is when don when they rushed the 88 gun that um took off one of his friend's heads uh, when they right off the drop zone, off the landing zone. Mm. And I was able to show that he was about to bayonet uh, a German soldier, you know, a, a German artillery soldier uh, at the eight, at the gun. And uh, he couldn't do it. But Don was like that. And the guy was like, you know, you know, please don't scream it. And so and I was like, well, Don, did you stick? Because I might have stuck him a little bit. But, <laughs> but no, I wanted everything right, especially down, you know, the differences that maybe the people that the, I'm sure the people listening to us, not a lot of comic book readers do. But, you know, there's there was so many subtle differences between, say, of the U.S. side, the U.S. Airborne Forces, between the 88, the 82nd and the 101st jumpers. I yeah. mean, you look at, you know, you look at the netting, the netting that the 101st used, they would they would use British netting, which was, I think, an inch, an inch. You know, the the, the, the netting was an inch apart. Yeah. The 88 yeah. used the more closed half inch, uh, which which the, the 101st end up using in, in Market Garden. Um, little things like that. And, and you know, like, again, a lot of them with the Thompsons. You know, they tuck the Thompsons in um, a lot, of, you know, aside from having it in a bag, you know, like like the like the the, the weapons bag. Um, and the same thing with the M1s, you know, like Jake McNeese told me that when he jumped, he wanted to be ready for combat. So he discarded the the uh, you know, the, the the M1 case that you had to actually you had to the, the, the rifle was broken down into three pieces. So upon landing, those paratroopers had to they didn't have the quick release harnesses. They had the T5s or whatever they were. So they couldn't, you know, they had to unbuckle it. Yeah. Right, um, yeah. And then they had to assemble their weapons. You know, uh, a lot of the a lot of the 82nd guys, they jumped with their their M1s, you know, shoved in uh, without the bag. So they knew that when you land, you're not going to be you're not going to have time to assemble your weapon for the, for the most part. Um, so I want to throw that in there. And, you know, just all I want. I had to get the war paint uh, particularly right for, you know, because you see the war paint. a lot. It's depicted a lot of what the Filthy 13 war and that sometimes it's red and white and, you know, it's very, you know, it, it looks crazy. Like, you know, like a, like a 1950s, uh, you know, Western TV show, uh, war paint, but, uh, no, it's just Jake was taking, you know, they took that white, that black and white paint off the invasion stripes out that freshly yeah, exactly. painted oil paint. And they just, you know, and, and Jake was just, Jake started doing it for himself. And then some of the other guys did it and, yeah, Jake and, told me the exact same story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Black, one finger in the white, one on the black, on the wings of the plane, down there, did that, did that, and then otherwise went, yeah, that's cool. We're doing yeah. it as well. Yeah, and then um, and then yeah. the camera and then the camera showed up. You know, the cameraman showed up, and that's when Jake started to really start to then to do all. You know, if you look at Jake's war paint when he did it first, he's got two black spots here. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? He just and he just and then so, but while when the camera started rolling, you say I think it's it's uh, Mike Marquez. I think he was doing. I think it was him. Um, He's sitting there and he's, you know, he's now he's, he's really taking his time because you know, he, wants effort, to be on, yeah. he wants to be on, he wants to be on camera. <laughs> so. I mean, and, and for those who are, who, who aren't familiar, Billy, you write and you illustrate, whereas Ferg and Garth, you, you write and then you pass on the illustrations to others. So okay. Billy, you have even more freedom to do, you know, because you conceive it and then you see it through to, a, to a, 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 a further stage, which must be fantastic for you to have a bit, if you're a control freak, you have a little yeah. bit more, uh, 
yeah. control there. But I mean, the, the fact that you're talking about detail, I think is amazing because we had a show a few, a few weeks ago about crappy war films and these awful ones with reenactors made now where everything, the gear oh. is crap and the and the uniforms are crap and the helmets and the web gear is crap. And yet in comics, in my, in my research for this again, the level of detail I think is consistently really high there. Sure, there's some simplification on some designs, but the, the, the detail is there. But the theme I really wanted to bring up because I think it's the most the fascinating one about the comics is the the idea that you, when writing comics, can bring themes in that conventional military historians can't do, and by that I mean the the cowardice, martinet officers, soldiers who run away, um, things going wrong. Because you know, all my military historian friends, if they're writing about I don't know D Company, the Oxen Bucks, or or, or C Company, the five hundred first Barrow Jimmy Regiment, whatever it would be all the veterans would know there would always have been always that one guy who wasn't very good. But no one wants to write about him because you're insulting the memory of those who fought for their freedom. You don't want to bring that stuff up, so you kind of leave it. But what I love about what you can do in comics is you can bring those themes up. You can have that. You can have war lovers. You can have absolute bona fide yeah. kind of yeah. psychos in comics. Yeah. yeah. And the fact is, if you look at the studies by people like SLA Marshall, who was looking at the figures, some men who go into combat get a bit, you know, you've been there, Billy. You've, you've probably met some of these people. That, well, that, yeah, that's the thing, is, you, know, you know, and Garth, I don't know if it, and, and it's for the same thing with, you know, the stereotypes. You know, when I was, you know, my platoon, we had all those guys. There was the ass kisser. There was a guy who just whined all the time about things. There was the bragger. There is that, you know, then there's yeah. a kid, from, you know, we had, you know, Two, we had a, a, a kid from Iowa, a buddy of mine, Scott Mills, and he's from Iowa to this day, and he's, uh, he's a, an accountant for a major tractor factory now. Brilliant, brilliant guy. I think he was a first-year college student. He decided to go in. Um, and, uh, but here's this whitest white Midwestern you know, intellectual who became best friends with Martinez, who was a teenager off the streets of East L.A. who had gotten shot in the back you know, a year earlier and they became the best friends. And, and so a lot of times there, there is that, that stereotype. Cause you know, like, Oh, here's the guy, the New Yorker, the, you know, that might've been me, the big mountain New Yorker, you know, and then you got the, the quiet, you know, guy from Alabama, you know, and then you got, you know, my buddy, uh, it's so funny, but it, you know, in the service back this is 1990, uh, we had a buddy and, and uh, he's from Miami. He was black football player. Great, great guy. Gary, Gary, his name was, but everyone called him Blackie. You know, like in World War II, we had the, every Indian was called chief. You know what I mean? Yeah, like like yeah. Native Americans, they called them chief. And it's just strange. And, you know, we loved each other, you know, but, you know, they called me a WAP, you know, and stuff like that. But that's how we were. That's that's how it, it, you did have that stereotypes. And again, you're right in comics. I mean, in the films, it's tough to do that, to, to, to tell that, because uh, it's like um, you don't want to insult the memory of those because they're all heroes. All the guys yeah. that went through that, they're heroes. But again, in comics, and again, I can test it, Garth. I just think he's brilliant. I could talk about Garth's books all day. Uh, he's such an inspiration. Always, you really are. And I, I know I'm gushing, but, but uh, he's he, talk about character. And again, the, the Tarantino reference, perfect. Tim, so maybe well, let's bring Garth in now because yeah. <laughs> you're, you're Garth, you're talking about, and then we'll bring Ferg and Garth. You're talking about yeah. how you, it's all about the character. And mm. do you enjoy, therefore, that freedom of saying, I'm going to make this guy the, 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 the coward i'm gonna make this guy go on the redemption journey that that must be kind of the almost the fun bit you're restricted by the keeping it in a historical setting but mm -hmm. in terms of character you can do what the hell you want can't you so tell us about how, how the freedom of that well what what we have in comics um and it's something that people working in tv have to an extent is we have space and we have time. We have what we need to tell the stories in a longer form than, say, someone in a two-hour movie, where, as you say, they really do have to abridge what they're going to do, and they have to boil it right down uh, to its basic components. Um, TV. I mean, one thinks of Band of Brothers, which was a, which is still, I, I think, the, the benchmark for yes. this kind of material on TV. It's so good. they 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 managed to get everything right, but. What we have even beyond in comics, even beyond people making TV shows, is we have the space to tell as long a story as we like, and we can cover so much more ground than anyone else. 
Um, if you look at Band of Brothers, for instance, I think it probably took about two years to make, and it was a major investment of time and capital for everyone involved. Now, on the other hand, in the, in the time I've been doing war comics, I've been able to do multiple stories on the Russian front. Uh, I've been able to do stories about the, um, the Yom Kippur War in 1973, uh, set on the Golan Heights. Uh, I've been able to write the string bags about the swordfish operations that I mentioned. Um, I've been able to write about American paratroopers, British squatties in Italy, um, Irish soldiers in the British Army, uh, long range uh, uh, Mustang pilots flying against Tokyo, the Tuskegee Airmen. If I'd been working in film or even television, I wouldn't have been able to cover a fraction yeah. Yeah. of this territory and yet this is something we can do because even in a three issue 60 page comic story i can get across an enormous amount of material with the characters i want to write about with the various types you, you've mentioned um, and then i can move on and i can do something completely different from motor gunboats in the english channel back to the russian front to vietnam mm. um the the the, the scope that comics give you by, by their sheer simplicity is, I think, a massive advantage. Well, I mean, we'll bring, I mean, I was talking to John Orloff, who is the writer of episodes two and 10 of Band of Brothers, and he's also writing Masters of the Air, the forthcoming Apple eight right. Air Force series. And you know, he'll, he'll, he'll write something on a page. Well, that's 50 million to film that. That's, he'll, he'll, he'll be thinking, because mm. if, he's, if he's writes, you know, 50 B-17s flying into Germany and then being jumped by 10 Messerschmitt one. That's 50 million there. Whereas you can just say, yeah, and hand it to an artist. And there you are. There's your 50 aircraft, um, massive, great scene. And it's all done with pen and ink. So you have a, a complete freedom. So Ferg, you know, you, you, and, and someone, someone's watching has says, up until May this year, you've done 329 commandos. So someone has, wow. someone knows your career, <laughs> Ferg. You've got a so good call, call it, possibly. <laughs> so, um, Tell us a bit, you know, so you've got that freedom. You, you've, you've tackled sub, you know, you've tackled desert campaign. There must be a, a real freedom of just saying, well, which theatre shall I go to this week? Yes, yes, there, there is that. Um, and of course, you know, I, I watch a lot of war documentaries, stuff on YouTube, read books and what have you. So you're always finding out, I always knew the broad brushstrokes of World War II, but then you find out the sort of like the smaller incidents and campaigns and things like that, you know, what happens to a company in such and such an action and what have you, and something will spin, spin off of that, really. So, um, uh, so I've lost my thread here. Remind That's me. All right. I mean, well, you know, just so the, the freedom you have to just tackle whatever subject you want. So, you know, you can you can on Monday, you can be writing a story about the desert. Or on Thursday, you can put that one on hold and you can go into the, you know, Stalingrad under siege. And, you know, that you've got all that. And, then, and it's the characters are all yours. I mean, you have a freedom that filmmakers yeah. just don't have. I mean, because it's all in your head. I mean, and and your attention to detail that you and Garth and Billy are saying, I think is, is extraordinary. And I'm really hoping that people watching this are, are, are understanding that World War II comics are an important aspect of getting across history, just like anything else. So, um, um, yeah, Billy, you know, let's, 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 so, you know, we, you touched on those guys you served with. And so when you're doing World War II, you've got that freedom. You can talk about cowardice. You can talk, is that, how do you find that? Is it freeing to be able to do what you want with characters? Oh yeah. Um, that's the one thing you get away with um, is, is to, is the characters because they don't seem to really read that um, with the lost battalion that we did. DC wanted the, the editorial that the wanted Sergeant Rock to be brought back at Normandy. And I'm like, oh, Normandy. Well, that's a whole comic book you should do on Normandy. Well, no, that's just the first issue because then he's going to transfer to another unit uh, and fight in the Vosges Mountains because that was my pitch was, was the Battle of the Vosges Mountains. And I'm like, all right, fine. So, as long, you know, they got their Normandy scene, um, which was fun to draw. Uh, again, I love that stuff. I'm known, you know, I'm known for drawing women, you know, female characters and things like that, or, or the samurai stuff. And, but man, I love drawing tiger tanks and P-51s and <laughs> Corsairs and, you know, and, and, you know, Garands and, and everything like that. I, I love doing that. But um, the character stuff is the things you can get away with in the details because uh, 
again, ultimately it's their book that they're paying for um, and their characters, you know, Sergeant Rock is their characters, but I was able to get away, you know, with, um, to do that. And I love the idea of like little short shot to bring him up that there was a German sniper. And this really happened during the battle of the Vosges uh, that there was a sniper hunting, you know, the, the, the 141st, the, the, the men of the 36th infantry division. And uh, we, so we sent little short shot over the wire, you know, and I don't know if you saw that, if you read that scene mm, and, yep. and he ends up, you know, and there, there's the, you know, the, the sniper with his scope and he sees a helmet, you know, and he, and he, goes in on it and all of a sudden it's blurry and he pulls out and there's little sure shot standing there, you know, and he takes him out, whatever. And little sure shot comes back and he gives, uh, he gives, you know, ordinate, you know, um, the maps, things like that, the bat, you know, all, all the snipers correspondence to the Lieutenant. And then he gives rock, you know, the, the, the Mauser rifle that the K 98. And then he says, here, souvenir for you, rock. And then rock looks down at, uh, at, um, <clears throat> a little short shot and he's got a scalp hanging from his from his web belt you know and mm. and uh rock says what's that and then and then short shot says uh souvenir for me you know so that's kind of fun that i could play with that that and i don't think they even read it that he scalped the, the german you know the german sniper <laughs> and that did but, happen then you know that is that is what it may sound gruesome but that is one of those things that definitely had happened in normally i i know i know numerous cases of people who who did that and they weren't always native american they were some of the people who were Borrowing a bit of misappropriating a bit of Native American uh, uh, culture there, but yeah. Don want Don tried to Don wanted to do that. If you know yeah. that, you read that story, <laughs> he was so pissed. And, and, he the dead German with this long blonde hair, and he's like, "Man, we had to get almost, you know, we had to shave our heads down before the invasion." He was mad. He crawled out, and they thought he was a medic, and he wanted to scalp him. He told me. <laughs> That well, that is one of, the, there's one of the reasons. I mean, there's, 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 we're going into historical detail, but most of the paratroopers for D-Day, British, American, they, they cut their hairs short, buzz cuts. It was partly for just hygiene and health and, you know, yeah. knits. That kind of, but it was also the rumors were doing the rounds of the fact that Germans could grab you by the hair. And, put, and if you haven't got any hair to grab, no one can grab you. So there's kind of a historical precedent for kind of fearing that someone's going to grab you by the hair. But my next question, and we can circle around and get back to some other subjects again, but the next question is, and when I talked about on Twitter about doing this show about war comics, I, you know, a couple of people po put up the idea that war comics glorify World War II or glorify combat. Um, and I'm going to be a bit heavy now and quote uh, Francois Truffaut, the uh, French director, who the Nouveau Var, he started in the 1950s and 60s, and he always said that there is no such thing as an anti-war film Basically, there's good films and there's bad films. And, and I would extend that, therefore, to comics and say there's no such thing as anti-war or pro-war. There are only good comics and bad comics. I'm, I'm assuming you're, all three of you are going to kind of agree with me on that, that if, if it's a good story told well, wars are graphic, wars are bloody. You're not glorifying it. You're showing the reality of it. So, you know, Garth, I, mean, I suppose we'll bring you in first because your your comics are from that. You know, we mentioned the, the Tarantino kind of name. Yours, there's quite a lot of. You know, I'm whole, I've got the Battlefields one here, mm. and there's there's quite. Well, I just opened up on a page there. There's quite a lot of blood there. You know, <laughs> so you know, I'm brilliant. I mean, I love it. But what what's your response to the idea that war comics glorify warfare? Um. Well, it would probably be a very helpful sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, when I think about the notion of, of glorifying war, whether it's film or comics, um, it, is, it is difficult to do a, a story that is a, an anti-war story that, or, or any kind of war story that doesn't at some point, shall we say, get the blood pumping, that doesn't show... Uh, people or hardware committed to what we'll call blazing battle action. Sure. Um, there is a kind of war story uh, and some graphic novels have been done in this, some films where they focus um, almost completely on the victims of war. Uh, the people who have to suffer the aftermath, who have to live in the war zone after the troops have moved on and all that's left is destruction and they have to pull their lives together. I, I don't think any of the three of us really do stories like that. I think we mostly focus on combat. And if you're looking at, at stories like that, which you might think of as more traditional war stories, yes, it's difficult to be anti-war 
when you have sequences that are uh, heavy on the action, heavy on the adrenaline. Um, if you think of Charlie's War, mm. which is a famous British comic strip, which uh, the, the writer of which, Pat Mills, I think would, would claim was an anti-war strip. And I think he's right, ultimately. Um, but it does include sequences within it alongside scenes of terrible suffering in the Battle of the Somme, the Battle of Passchendaele and so on, where he shows um, British tanks in World War I smashing through a village and into a church, guns blazing, cutting down the Germans, great steel behemoths crashing through the walls. He has the Battle of the Falklands in uh, the World War I Battle of the Falklands, which was a naval battle where yeah. a British cruiser is um, charging after a German cruiser, uh, the crew determined to run them down. Um, and bring their guns to bear where they're even burning the, their own lifeboats to get whatever they have to into the furnaces to get more power to the engines. And this is where the story I would contend stops being anti-war and starts being more of a pure war story. There are also a lot of aerial combat sequences. There are zeppelins over London in Charlie's War. Uh, there's uh, dog fights over the, uh, the Western Front. And this is where the notion of it being a pure anti-war story does start to fall down. It's very, very hard to make anything into a pure anti-war story unless perhaps you focus on what happens when the guns fall silent mm. and people have to start putting, try, as I say, trying to put their lives back together. Um, much good work has been done there. It's just that I don't really think that's what the three of us do. And I don't think it's really the kind of war comics or war stories we're talking about today. So it can be done, but not not with the kind of material we do really. Yeah, I mean, I, that makes sense to me. And I think I, I think it's too, having anti-war and war is too black and white. There's a big gray area in the middle where you can get across a story in a in a in an exciting way and still get across the gravity of, of, of warfare. I don't think they're mutually think so. exclusive. And Billy wants to jump in there because you know, you know, you you was you serve Billy, you yeah, know, and you I, so I, I, I think Pat Mills in and Joe Col 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 I, I never can pronounce his last name. How would you say? Colhoun. Colhoun. Okay, yeah. Joe, Joe. I think what Garth was just talking and what you brought up too, Paul, is that Pat was able to capture in one panel, which to me is I think is the greatest comic panel ever written, ever illustrated, written, illustrated, was when they're I, maybe they're in Paris or whatever, but you see a train come. You see the train and the train is loaded up with all the wounded British soldiers going back, either back to the hospital, going back to the UK. And then they've just disembarked all the replacement soldiers. So the replacement soldiers are going one way. It's one panel. And you know what I'm talking about, Garth. And the train is heading yeah, out the other. One. And there's one dead man in the center with a priest standing over him. So, you know, and, and it, that, it, that doesn't sum up what, what war is, is that the wounded go home. You know, they're on there, you know, the, the wounded are, are being sent back. The fresh, you know, healthy guys, you know, the new recruits, the fresh fra the, the fresh face, you know, replacements are heading towards the front to this hell and will and the dead's forgotten. Mm. And it's an amazing if you see Pat, you guys have a tell him it's still to this, it's it just resonates to me today. I think it's the greatest comic. Well, it's panel. interesting because Pat was the first person I actually contacted for this, and he was gonna do it and then he decided not to do it and it was basically that whole subject of when does anti-war become war and you yeah. know i respect pat and he was very he wished us well and it, in, in the end we just decided to kind of not move forward with him on it but when i was again when i was reading um guard's book and i've read all of you as i was looking at the commandos and the the, the, the most you, you mentioned band of brothers early, um garth and the most ex, one of the most expensive stunts in that was in episode three the buddy gulch one when the, i think it's a stug goes over mm. the German soldier in the ground. Right. Um, and that was a stunt man in a metal cage. And there's a Facebook group for kind of crew members and stunt guys from Band of Brothers. It's a great photos and the actors on it as well. And I'm part of that. And it was a great sequence. And you have a similar bit in, in Tankies where, right. the, 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 yeah, go. but the thing about a comic is when I was reading it, I can kind of hold that image in front of my eyes for 30 seconds if I want. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you're watching a film, 
it's it's played right. past very quickly. So right. a graphic scene in a comic is there as a single image that someone can kind of illustrate. And so comics have a very different way of conveying that kind of violence because you can it's the reader's own pace they want to go yeah. through it can't they? they can they can move over it quickly whereas an, a film is at the, the pace of an editor yeah so yeah. When, when you're when you're putting violence in i mean we'll bring ferg in you know there are i mean that, that i'm again reading my commandos and battles again i'm surprised how i'm remembering them i'm remembering them more exciting for my child but actually there are lots of scenes of men standing over graves there are lots of scenes of men seeing their fault their, their buddies being killed i'm noticing more as a 51 year old reading them now as i was when i was 10 so so ferg you know you, you've with all your comics and living in britain have you spoken to veterans who i mean do veterans read your comics i mean but have have you spoken to people who serve what do they think what's your, what i mean what and you you work with the imperial war museum for example so how do you think comics sit in that whole presenting violence uh kind of world well, I've only had one real experience of a veteran commenting on a comic of mine, and it wasn't a um, World War II one. I was doing some research for a story set in Malaya about a combat medic, and I had to find out really fast, because I had a deadline, if he'd have a, um, a pistol or not. So I went online, and um, to cut a long story short, a guy from a Vietnam veteran site got back to me, 11th Armoured Cavalry, called Doc Brown. He was a medic, and he said, well... Some guys refuse to take a weapon into battle, medics, the first time. But after the first engagement, they always, um, they always grabbed one because, you know, you're getting shot at as you're attend tending somebody, you're, you know, um, you're in danger of life sort of thing. So um, I, stayed in, I stayed in touch with him. The information was really useful at the time. Stayed in touch with him and ended up sending him uh, about five or six Vietnam War stories I'd done in commando book form. Um, he got back to me, wrote, wrote to me a couple of months later. He said he'd taken him to um, a reunion, an official reunion, passed him around his mates over the weekend. And um, the general feeling was, was that I told it as it was. And that is the biggest compliment I've ever had from any reader in, in my life. If, if a veteran thinks I've got it right, and I, I, I was pleased with that. Um, especially with the format of Commando is, um, compared to Gar's work, there is a restriction because um, initially there, there were aimed at boys mm. rather than mm. adults or even um, teenagers sort of things. I tend to think these days it's mainly at an adult readership, but you've got to be careful with it. And um, so the, the editorial line is, you know, you can't be too graphic and think things like that. Um, so um, you know, compared to Garth, I've got to be a little bit more restrained, uh, even though the stuff I'd like to show. Um, what, what I can do, though, is... Um, Still, still deal with the effects of combat on um, soldiers and thing, things like that. You know, shell shot, whether it lasts for 10 minutes or um, or um, for a couple of years, it really affects their career and their services, things like that. In fact, um, I'm trying to make, make this brief. I watched a film called Passchendaele. It was a, it was a Canadian-made one. Mm. It wasn't very yeah. impressed with the storytelling of it, but it was a scene. Um, towards the end, when the Germans and Canadians were fighting in the mud and smashing each other with helmets and bricks and things like that. And I suddenly thought, what would it be like seeing your friend kill somebody? An actual friend of yours killed somebody. And I actually started exploring. I was lucky enough for my editor at the time, Callum Laird, let me go for that. And I, and I managed to do a story called The Sergeant and the Squad about these rookies and a veteran sergeant. And uh, his job was to whip them into shape and make them combat soldiers and make them sort of young know, jungle savvy, this sort of thing. Um, and had to moralize it slightly being a commander book. At the end, thinking they were going to emulate the sergeant, we found a wounded Japanese and were about to shoot him. The sergeant pulls him away and goes, no. He says, I want you to be soldiers, but I don't want you to be a soldier like me. Um, so that way I was about to con convey that, you know, um, there should be a limit to brutality and stuff like that, you know, even though it's, even though it's war. I mean, that's a perfect comment because that exactly is what I was trying to get at in the early, early part of the show. This idea that you can, all three of you, bring up themes, some really quite complicated, complex themes that the conventional military, military historians just kind of can't do because there's a different audience. And, and that's why you know, I firmly believe that World War II comics have as much importance, not just in influencing these, these historians when they were growing up, but now in conveying, in, in conveying um, 
history to people because it's about opening up new audiences. I've done shows about video games and World of Tanks and things like that. And I'm my I'm very inclusive. I, I don't want to start saying, well, no, no, comics are no good because they're just for kids and t- video games are no good because it's just for kids. That's a very, very narrow way of looking at things. And I think there's a lot to be taken from comics and there's a lot to be taken from war films and video games. So, you know, Garth, when you're, again, you've brought up what I would consider for a general, some general, some pretty obscure World War II subjects, you know, mm. you know, perhaps commando and battle and no offense for they do stick a little bit more in kind of comfort zone but you garth you know the female the night witches and the 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 spanish civil war i was reading about Mm -hmm. yesterday you know you can go in some really interesting areas so when you're what uh, the next question of all of you really but it's who are you reading now what military you know ferg you said you watch youtube and things are there historians that you particularly admire out there writing today and what kind of books are you looking for are you looking for kind of the first person books or the the sweeping kind of battle epics what what kind of floats your boat these days garth um i cast a pretty wide net i mean i have my favorite historians uh like um max hastings like anthony beaver um i, I was very sorry to see that carlo deste just passed yeah, that, last um, week yeah I, uh, I, really, I really think of him as um, the, the best American historian of, of the Second World War, um, perhaps limited only by the, uh, the, the relatively small number of books that he wrote. But I, I thought his approach was, um, was really better than almost anything I'd read in, in the American historiography of World War II. I thought his books were wonderful. Um, Beyond that, I, I do try to keep up with um, personal memoirs. I, I always find that um, it's nice when you run across someone writing a memoir, a, a, a war memoir, who can, frankly, who can actually write, yeah. not someone who's just, frankly, his skill his skill set probably lies elsewhere, and he's just sort of planting the story in front of you with pr- perhaps... I, without any real style or aplomb, someone who hasn't hooked up with a very obvious ghostwriter, but someone who can really write. I mean, the, the best example I can think of is uh, George MacDonald Fraser, who Oh wrote, God, yeah, caught it out uh, here. Yeah, fantastic yeah, stuff, here. yeah. Uh, I mean, we know he can write because he wrote the Flashman novels and yeah. a number of screenplays. He wrote the, uh, the Border Reavers about uh, the uh, wars, the, the uh, sort of conflict on the Scotland-England border. but. Then he decided to tell his own story about his time with the, uh, the the British Army in Burma towards the end of World War II, and it's a stunning memoir. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah, it, brilliant. It, it brings the story alive in the way that only our truly great writer can do. So it's that mixture of personal memoir and um, uh, more conventional military historian that that I tend to go to go for to this day. Mm. Uh, and Ferg, who who do you read? Well, pre- pretty much the same. Anthony Beaver I found very, very useful. And also Charles Whiting. Now, he wrote fictional stuff, I believe it was. Was it Leo yeah, or something? Or... Called ba- Battle of 44. He wrote one about Normandy. Yeah. It was a fictional but, one. Yeah, yeah. Was, was, that, was that Charles it, McKay? I don't know. Yeah. Right. Now, I found that when, when he's writing as himself, I am Charles Whiting. He's got one particular book, The Poor Bloody Infantry. And I read that after I'd written about my second or third commando book. And it's got stuff in there which, yeah, you know, including, you know, soldiers um, and to be sent down down the line in combat because they got the clap or something like that and just mm. couldn't function, you know, and damn, you know, the wise guys in the American army set up the black market in Paris and, um, you know, British dessert is going to work with them and things like that. So I found, I found that to um, very very interesting guy there one book i read recently i've seen a tv series a couple of times so i finally got around to reading the generation kill book by Eve, evan wright mm. Mm. I found out mm. as much as TV says a real eye opener because I, I tend to sort of read more about World War II stuff really. So um, reading about modern troops who've grown up in a modern world like I have, you know, with um, MTV and all this sort of thing and going into war singing disco songs and stuff like that, you know, I found that pretty fascinating. Um, uh, I think one of my favourites though, and I, do, I do like writing aviation stories like Garth does, and I found First Light by Jeffrey Wellham. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, especially the way that um, by the end of it, he was a wreck. Yeah. yeah. 
And they sent, and it ended up back in combat again due to some uh, Malta convoy sort of thing. And it was such a human story. I, I found that one of the best ones written, to be honest, there. Yeah, that one was terrific. But, uh, yeah, I'm good mates with James Holland and James Holland knew Jeffrey Wellham really well. And yeah, he comes up all the time and just incredible writing. And I want to bring up what Garth did a minute, but but Billy, who are your inferences right now? Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned Bieber. I, I actually just saw, I just bought a, about a month ago um, the Crete 1941 book that mm -hmm. Anthony Bieber wrote. It's fantastic. And uh, I'm, a, I'm an aviation nut myself. I mean, if you look up, I got my little battle oh, yeah. going on there with all my little you know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, I hope that's a Mark the, Nine. Yeah, yeah, the, the Barry. <laughs> it's my Kane, favorite you know, oh, yeah. Mark Nine. Anyway, but I, yeah. I, but uh, I love you know Len Dayton's Fighter. I love that book. I've read it probably at least twice. Um, but again, the same the same as the boys here. Uh, they we all seem to, to to like the same the same people. You know, I mean, there's there's so many good ones out there. But uh, I, again, I, I gravitate towards more towards the airborne, but also the aviation stuff. But um it, it's cool when you get friends too that you guys share books yeah. you know and like someone reads oh you got to read this and you you, you, you know you, you share books and all but uh yeah that, that I'm, I'm pretty much in line with, with I mean, them I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm jumping back on what garth said there about about the modern the war memoirs that are frankly shit and and it happens to me i was i, I live in normandy now and i go back to london not this year and I'm in the big book, Waterstones or something. And I'm looking at all those, and they often they have great covers. They're the art departments have these great, and you see a picture of some Tommy or a pilot and there's lovely spitfires in the back. And you go, and you start reading and you go, I'm sure there's a story there, but it is written <laughs> so badly. Yeah. You end up, you come out of it worse than when you went into it because <laughs> you kind of lost respect for the subject because it's so tragic. I mean, a funny story years ago, you know the unbroken story, the one, yeah, the the, the run of Louis Zamperini and the the, the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. I read his own book like twenty years ago. I, I I bought it from his own website, and then then the 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 the, the, the proper book by the what's the name Laura, I've forgotten her name now. The proper book, Unbroken, came. I said, oh, you should read it, Paul. And I said, I can't. I've already, I know the story is crap. <laughs> and and I read Laura Hillenbrand. And I bought her version. And, and I had them kind of side by side. And everything was there. The same stuff, you know, beating off sharks, crashing in the ocean, Japanese prisoner of war. Except that when he wrote it himself, it was just shit. <laughs> when she took it, it was amazing. And it proves that the story is only as good as how it's written. And that's where, you know, bringing it back to World War II comics again, because that's what we're talking about. A well-written comic is, I would argue, a hundred times better than a shit written genuine memoir because it will grip people. It will make them want to go on and learn more and, and pick up an Anthony Beaver, a James Holland, a Peter Caddick Adams. And I think that's the point there. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're kind of going around in circle now, but where my next question, then we can open up to, uh, in fact, well, I've got questions, a couple of questions from people watching on YouTube, but where, what's the next thing for, for, um, for World War II comics? Because I don't know whether you've seen Alex Kershaw's Liberator series on Netflix. Mm -hmm. um, is that going to be the new thing? Oh, is that where oh, we're going to go like, now? I, uh, if I may, I, 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 I know you... Alex, by the way, so whatever you say, I'll go and tell him immediately. So oh, be nice. I, I don't know. I found it very <laughs> distracting the, you know, that the, the, the combination of it almost of art, and I, I, started watching, I started watching it and I'm like, all right, I got to sit down and really pay attention to this because it, it was too distracting. I felt with the, it was almost like trying to make a comic book come to life. Yeah. So I haven't even, it, it just was weird. And again, some of the uniforms are off and that's the stuff that drives me crazy. You know, like uh, uh, of the, the soldiers, they're wearing different things, you know, the, the, the helmet markings were wrong and stuff like that. And, you know, they had the little Sergeant stripes on the, on the helmet. I think one of the guys and, and uh, it kind of took me out of it. So I'm like, all right, I want to watch it because, you know, I've, I've read things that it's supposed to be great. But uh, just that it just seemed a little too distracting with the art, you know, that that the way they the animation, whatever you want to call it, rotoscoping or whatever they were doing with it. Yeah, I think it's rotoscoping. I mean, have you seen it, Garth? Yeah, um, I, I, I think we were definitely seeing a first attempt. We were definitely seeing a, a new kind of. Uh, storytelling technology that was very obviously in its infancy. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is the first time they've really tried something like this. Uh, one of the things that occurred to me was if you're going to have live action figures in the foreground and an animated background, well, you should be able to do anything you want with the background. You should be able to fill the sky with aircraft. Uh, the Anzio sequence, 
uh, I thought that would have been an opportunity to have a masked panzer attack, which of course we know is one of the, the things that happened at Anzio. And yet you get one sort of scrappy looking panzer chugging along and some charging German figures who seem to be repeated. Mm. You know, the same figure kind of photoshopped it or wrong term, but used many times over. Yeah, yeah. So we're definitely seeing something that, that has room for improvement. I think they could definitely get it there. The, the, the obvious advantage would be, what, as I say, what you can do with it when they get it right. Uh, you would be able to recreate major battle scenes that at the moment you simply cannot because the number of aircraft aren't there. The CGI isn't quite good enough. Um, so I think I think what you're saying is the first step on a path to something great there. Yeah, that's how I feel about it. I mean, the storytelling was good. I mean, the book is great and the book translates to those four episodes quite well. But I, it took me a while to get into that kind of. So what am I watching here? Is this a cartoon? Because that's that's real movements there. But again, the background, there was a the, the first episode. I think it's if it's Sicily, if I remember correctly, or Italy. And they had like one Panzer four and a Stug. And I thought, what? It's, it's, it's animation. Put seven in. Put seven yeah. and 1488. Why? Why? Why are you limiting yourself? If it's a real film, sure. But why? Why have you? But you know, I, I we're going to have Alex on at some point and talk to him about that. But maybe that's the next the next step. Is, is I would imagine is, they'll get there. You know, they'll yeah, get yeah. where they're going. But this is just the first the first step, as I said. So I mean, I'm looking back on what we had on YouTube. So um, one of the particular question, Paul Trimble is watching, who's the you know that runs the battle page on Facebook. But one of the questions was for Garth, but all of you, what do you think of D Day Dodgers, the Alan Hebden book? Was a question for Garth from. I'm forgetting who that was from now, but uh, the D-Day Dodgers book. Uh, you see, you obviously read that. Uh, that's that's Alan's commando book. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think, yeah. I, I he he. Alan actually was kind enough to to send me a PDF of that. Uh, yeah, I thought that was a good one. Um, it's a subject I've covered myself. Alan certainly goes into it in greater detail than I did. Um, but yes, I enjoyed it. Uh, anything on the Italian campaign, I'm I'm on board for it generally. Yeah, and 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 um, and if, um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought there. So Billy, I mean, you know, Sergeant Rock is kind of on hiatus a little bit at the moment now. What, what is he going to come back? Are you going to do more? I don't know. World War II I don't stuff? know what they're. Yeah, they weren't interested in it. To be honest with you, they they really. Um, I mean, they. I don't know what they're doing. To be honest with you, over at DC Comics, they seem to be kind of uh, in a in a flux period. But uh, yeah, and the book was really well received. Um, it, it was a big hit. Um, but they didn't seem anyone up there in editorial or, or the suits or whatever. They really didn't seem that there's much of a future for, for, you know, a, a steady war book over from coming out of DC comics, a monthly war book or something like that. They, they've toyed with the idea a little bit, but, uh, they, they were more into the, the capes and masks than, then, you know, boots and mud, I guess. Well, that's kind of the big, you know, that's how many times they're going to remake Spider-Man films. I mean, and that, you know, but anyway, that's another sub, but that's not money my air in it. But I mean, I want to bring in you again, Billy, because I know when we were talking about the email, there's a particular story, and I'll ask this to, to Garth and Ferg as well. You you incorporate a genuine 501st story into the, um, the Sergeant Rock thing based on a guy in the 501st in the Ardennes. And it's, coming up for Christmas, it's coming up the anniversary of the Ardennes. So, so tell us how you came across that story and how you incorporate in there, because I think it's an amazing one. Oh yeah, that, that's probably my favorite that I've ever done with them with DC. And, and, and that's because I really had full reign. There really wasn't much dialogue at all in it. Uh, there might've been two or three word balloons on, on the last page. Um, and it's a story of Donald Deems, a first Sergeant Donald Deem on Christmas Eve outside of Bastogne. Um, and uh, they're on the line with his, with his men, and he uh, decides to go back and try to get them some, you know, some Cavaldos. I don't know if they had it over in Belgium, but some, some, some hooch, you know, for, the, for, the, for his guys on the line. And the officers are having a party uh, in town, and he, uh, he goes in, and he steals a whole bunch of booze, and he goes walking, um, to, uh, walking back to the line, and he comes underneath this train trestle. If you go back a little bit, if you go back a page, it's only five pages. Yeah. Um, and this is, and I'll tell the whole story. And so there he is, he crosses another soldier. They wave, you know, they, they nod at each other and then they look and they realize that they're actually, one's a German and one, one's an American. They fumble for their weapons. They both slip on the ice, they fall down and they just start laughing. 
And the German turns him and says, got a cigarette yank. And that's that la- that bottom panel there. Yeah. And um, they spend Christmas Eve together the, the, drinking underneath this train trestle. Mark Bando's the one that told me about the story. And um, <clears throat> and uh, they, they share photographs. They share addresses. And at the very end, you, you see, and I wrote little things here. Now, I want to do it with Rock. If you look at that, the panel on the right there, um, he's got straw in his in, inside of his uh, M43 jacket because they were rushed to the front so fast yeah, when yeah, the bulge yeah. happened. They had no winter winter clothing. So they um, they had to, you know, they, they were shoving, you know, hay and straw inside of their, their jackets, inside of their sweaters to try to keep warm. And uh, then if you scroll up, I had that Sergeant Rock's father, historically speaking, or scroll down to the bottom of the panel. Um, he was killed on, supposedly on the last day of World War I. Um, and then I have Felsen, which means Johannes Felsen in German means John Rock in, in, in German. That's his mm. father. So in a sense, they're both the same man. And he was killed on one of the first days of the war. His father was. And wow. they're, just, they're just talking about their fathers who lost, you know, who were killed in war. And, uh, and then at the very end, they, uh, you know, they, they were both ordered to shoot on sight. They come across an enemy and that's both their orders. And they end up firing their weapons into the air. And if you, you, you turn the page and you see the, the, the last page and uh, if you scroll back, yeah, you see that, you know, they're smoking and they smile and, and he says, you know, they, they wish each other a Merry Christmas and they go their, their own way. But the wonderful thing about the story is that, you know, and Mark Bando told me about it um, and is that this book, uh, Sergeant Deem, passed away like a year before this came out. And I never got to meet him. But in 1985, a woman showed up at his door, at, at his, on his doorstep. And she was a German woman uh, who was working for the United Nations. And she said, my father gave me your address and told me that if I ever get to the United States to look up my friend who I spent Christmas Eve with, it was that German soldier's daughter that he'd always kept the name of, of him or how she was able to find him if Donald moved, because he's from, uh, I think he's from Iowa, um, but she found him. And her father survived the war, but he had passed away in 1975, t- you know, 10 years earlier. And it's just one of the most beautiful stories, you know, that, you know, you hear, you see all these great stories about, you know, the 1914 Christmas truce and things like that. But just what a wonderful small story. And, and, and it's just about two men together in this world gone to hell that you can still find humanity, you know, through these two men by no fault of their own, find themselves there. You know, they were drafted into this conflict, you know, that was far bigger than any of them. But at the true sense of it, it's, it is about them. Yeah. And, uh, and, that, and that's and exactly I what I, I, you know, this idea of being able to incorporate stories that based on real research, showing real characters, character driven stories. So Garth, and perhaps, you know, you put you on a the spot there because that was a great story from Buddy, but what in your career as writing commandos and your war stories and battle, have you been able to incorporate a particular real story that something that you kind of put in subtly that was kind of for you, you know, is it something you look back and you think, I'm glad I put that in there because that was, because in the Ferg, your, fa- you know, your father was bomber command. Was it for you? Have you ever been able to put something in that was just kind of for you? As a... <laughs> To be quite honest, most of the stories my dad told me wouldn't be quite um, <laughs> for commando books. I mean, there's, a, there's one I'd love to put in. Uh, the story very briefly was he was in um, when he served the later stages of the war um, so, um, in India. And uh, there was a good natured um, sergeant there called Geordie. Everybody got on with him. And there was a right hard nut of a Glasgow sergeant called Snake. And um, one day, so we sat in the sergeant's mess. Snake came in, grabbed Geordie, and in front of everybody, kicked the living hell out of him. Nobody knew why. Nobody ever found out why. But uh, the next time, um, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a sergeant pilot. Next time he took his um, plane, plane up, it wouldn't have been a fighter plane. It would have been a transport plane, possibly a bomber. Um, after about two minutes, he told the crew, right, bail out. The crew, well, what's, what's wrong? The engines are fine. There's no, there's no zeros about it. Anything. Says, this plane's going down. Basically, he forced the crew to jump out and he crashed the plane in the side of him, Himalayas. Now, that is a fascinating story. We would not like to explore one day, but there's no way I could fit something like that into, into a commando book. It'd just be too brutal for the, for the reasons, especially if you start exploring the reasons why this happened. I mean, did he steal something of snakes? 
Did he try something on in the showers? Who, who knows? Yeah. So, but, uh, but other things I have managed to, to get. I mean, he did a great story telling my dad, but he'd never really told much about his actual hours in, in the air and th things like that. But um, towards the end of his life, um, I found out that my grandfather was at the Battle of the Somme. Hmm. And I went, oh, interesting. He was actually had been transferred to the cycle corps a year beforehand, and they were they were naively waiting for this great breakthrough, so, and then they could do what the cavalry did, you know, sort of um, move move through the gap and do scouting and things like that. So uh, I managed to do a recent commando book about the cycle corps in there, World War One, based on that. You know, it, it got me thinking about doing a bit of research and what have you, and it got to be quite personal. So in the end, I flipped it and actually did it as a comedy story about these kind of like. Um, you know, daft lads on on, side, mm. on cycles, not wanting to get anywhere near the front line, sort of thing. So, um, yeah, there has been uh, bits and little pieces. moments, yeah. Hmm. And Garth, what what have you managed to put in? Because I mean, you did all this research, you've done little little kind of moments of your own personal satisfaction, putting it for you rather than for the reader. Gosh, I mean, there there are hundreds. Uh, I mean, sometimes it'll be a single line that uh, sets you on the road to an entire story. Um, I, I try to use real events, real incidents as, as much as possible because it's, it, this is one of those aspects that um, of war stories that I think gives the genre its advantage over almost any other. The things that happen in war that don't happen in, in perhaps any other kind of human activity, um, that's what we're able to bring out. Um, you, you see people at their worst, you see people at their best. A, a specific example, God, I, I don't know. Off the top of my head, uh, I immediately think of um, the experiences I, I read of, of so many, uh, so many of Russia's women soldiers mm. who find themselves in the line alongside the men uh, against the Germans in World War II. Um, I think of uh, the uh, so many accounts uh, I, I ran across in the work of Svetlana Alexievich who's uh, a Russian researcher who wrote, among others, The Unwomanly Face of War, where she tried to get as much of the uh, female soldiers' experiences uh, into print as possible. Um, I get it's a bit gruesome, but the one that immediately pop, pops into my mind is the, uh, the medic, uh, the woman medic who under fire is trying to save a guy whose arm has been almost blown away and without a knife or scissors to hand, she has to bite through the chunk of flesh holding his arm on so that she can tie, uh, she can tie the, the stump off, stop the flow of blood and save his life. She had to do that with her teeth uh, while being shot at. That was something I got into a story because it's impossible to believe. It's, that kind, it's one of those aspects of reality that's absolutely impossible to believe to get your head around. And yet, like so many of these things, it happened. Um, it's gathering experiences like that and getting them into stories that, that I think helps maybe this is the whole maybe this is getting near the whole point of what we do but it helps to keep the experiences of that generation alive which is part of part of the job in a way of reminding people that there was a time when when everything was at stake and that the world we grew up with and enjoy was was delivered to us by the actions of ordinary people mm. uh perhaps that's Perhaps that is exactly why we do this. And perhaps that what I've just cited is just one tiny example of that. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense to me. And I'm sure Billy can attest and Fur can attest to that. You know, in all your writing about your, you know, Billy, your fantasy realms, working in World War II, there's that grounding in what people actually did. And, and if people hadn't done that for us, you wouldn't be able to write fantasy books because they would be the kind of thing that would be controlled by governments you can't write that so i'm going a bit deep there but the freedom to write what you want as artists <laughs> has been fought for you by the people who fought in world war ii so every time you put a world war ii story into a comic you know in your way like i am a, as a tour guide we're paying our debt to those people who did that for us and i think that's that's important so I think we kind of brought things round to a, to a, to an end, a, a conclusion now. Otherwise, we could end up talking all night. And, <laughs> um, although I enjoy it, but you know, any before we kind of sign off, any kind of closing remarks you want to say about the, the writing of World War II comics, or some point you want to make about 
a different way you see it or a role you feel you have or anyone? Yeah. Um, up till recently, um, quite naively, I was of the opinion that um, battle fatigue, combat stress, this sort of thing was a modern phenomenon because I, I was of the opinion that, um, you know, you go into line as a modern soldier, World War II, for example, and you can be three months in action, shelled all the time, seeing people killed all the time, that pressure on you all the time. And I thought, whereas older wars, you know, um, Napoleonic Wars, for example, you'd fight a battle for a day, but the rest of it was mainly marching and bivouacking and manoeuvres and this sort of thing. And I suddenly realised, oh, I've, I've got to check up about this. And I'm now doing a load of research and find out that wasn't the case. It was cases of combat stress in Roman times and um, officers committing suicide on the battlefield in Napoleonic um, battles, like, you know, Waterloo and what have you, because it just got to them. Um, and that's maybe because of the way that, um, you know, that's culture sort of perceived over the wars and things, things like, like that. But it's, that's something I'm going to be exploring more and more. Um, and in fact, in mo most genres, you don't really get that, you know, sci-fi, fantasy sort of thing. I mean, yeah, you can have a character, Hudson and Aliens, man, man, we're, we're doomed sort of thing, but it's very few, few and far between. So war does give us a chance to really explore, like Garth saying, humanity at its best and at its worst. And it, and things like what I'm just mentioned just now, combat stress, for example, it must be a universal thing. And I want to explore that more. No, definitely. I, 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 that, that to me is one of the most, fa I, as I, you know, I've got 1200 books on World War II and, and I feel I'm, I'm gradually getting to where I understand the battles and campaigns better. The thing I'll never understand is how it affects people who went through it. I mean, it doesn't matter how many veterans I sit with and the chance to meet World War II veterans is almost at an end now. They can explain to you what they saw, but you know that even hearing it, you're only getting a 5% of what that experience was like. And so I'll never understand what it was to be on a Russian convoy into Murmansk or what it was like to be on a desert patrol where you're washing yourself with gasoline because you can't have any drinking water. I'll never, I'll never get that sense. And maybe there's something about the graphic novel, the comic that can convey some sort of honesty of that raw kind of visceral experience that perhaps other mediums can't do. B Billy, Garth, any kind of comments on that? Yeah, I, and I think when it comes to writing, I mean, we truly are standing on the shoulders of giants, not just the writers themselves who came before us or, or artists, but also the, the, those men and women that served. And, and it's our responsibility to respect them and, and uh, to, 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 to let the world know what, what sacrifices they, they, they play, they, they made. And so many of them, millions of them, you know, never had you know, never had a, you know, uh, they never had, what is that tomorrow? They gave that tomorrow so we can have our today. Yeah. And so many of them yeah. gave that tomorrow's so we can have our today. And even those that came home, I mean, yeah. you're talking about band of brothers earlier. Remember David Webster was screaming at the hundreds of thousands of German prisoners, you know, that were marching and as they're heading, you know, mm -hmm. uh, East and the German prisoners are marching West. And he's like, you stupid sons of bitches, you know, you've wasted, you know, three years of my life, two years of my life for what? You know, for the, and look at you now, you know what I mean? As, as when they were marching West, how they looked, you know, I, I'm, you know, I mean, when they were marching, you know, to take over Europe and everything like that, how they looked, you know, with their pristine uniforms and all the pageantry and all the, so, you know, national socialism, all the bullshit. And now look at them, this ragtag, you know, bunch of, 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 you know, defeated soldiers. And here's the, the, the victors are just pissed because you ruined my life. And that's what yeah. it does. War ruins your life. You know, not everyone's going to be a George Patton. And war, war ruined his life too, didn't it? You know, well, indeed. So, yeah. You know, <laughs> absolutely. So, um, yeah, I think I think ultimately we, you know, in remembering these people and in telling stories about them, <clears throat> uh, we have to acknowledge every aspect of the stories, and that means not just the soldiers uh, of the Western Alliance who won as much of uh, Western Europe back. Uh, for democracy as they could. Uh, we also have to consider the Russians who, while not exactly fighting a war of liberation, did the hard work of breaking the back of the German army. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to consider the stories of the Germans and the Japanese as well. Uh, they were the enemy, they were fighting for a kind of imperialistic fascism, but their stories are, are as important uh, 
the enemy stories are important too. It's all part of the mosaic. Uh, it's all part of the, the, the absolutely fascinating whole that the World War II stories make up. I mean, that, that's a very good point. And actually, I, I kind of disagree with you to a sense. And I think people enlist for patriotic reasons. They enlist for, for flag, for country, for, for a cause. But I think when men actually fight by so, side by side, they're fighting for the guy beside them. Mm -hmm. And that is universal, whether you're Japanese, Russian, German, American. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm not talking about the extremes of the SS who go and murder people. I'm talking about your average combat soldier. When, when, when the Americans are running up Omaha Beach, when the British are in the air, they're, they're fighting for that guy on their wingman. That's who they're fighting for at that moment moment when when they get back home they tell their grandkids they were fighting for the for the freedom of europe but that's not actually what was going through their mind when they're in the air it's i don't want johnny to buy it over there when sergeant rock is leading his men across he doesn't want his squad to get killed that is his motivation and that's what the commander here is their motivation is so i think that's where comics can do so much because you're showing that men in combat are absolutely the same Where, whatever side they're fighting for whatever i read your comic the one garth about the four the four spanish civil war guys who end up in the foxhole yeah, yeah. and two are on one side and two on another, and they're all kind of there in the middle of it and they explain their reasons for being there and they're kind of the same but from opposite sides of the same coin mm -hmm. and it's just they're in this experience of of of, of fighting for for something that's personal to them. So anyway, we've, um, I think we've, we've had a great conversation. I've really enjoyed talking to you guys and, and we've got another show on Tuesday with some other people. Garth can come back in for that one. And, but Billy, you've been amazing. So um, uh, good luck with all your launches of your new books and stuff like that. And your nativity book is out in a new limited yeah, edition. That's on your website, all that there. And Ferg, let's see if you can make 400 commando books by the time yeah. I bring you back for something <laughs> next time. And, Garth, I can't wait to um, to read more of your stuff. So thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been absolutely fascinating. In terms of me, um, for what well, I've got my uh, Stalingrad show Sunday. It's Sunday morning because of the time difference with Stalingrad. We're going to be filming from the Island of Fire with Paul Errington and Mikhail out there for us. And we've got more shows coming up next week. So um, don't forget to click subscribe. Don't forget to uh, check out our Patreon site um, if you'd like to help contribute to these things. And it remains me to say once again, thank you, Ferg. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Garth. I've had a really good time. People have enjoyed watching it. So um, thank you very much. So I'm going to end the stream now and we'll see you all again at World War II TV very shortly. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks Bye. for having me, Paul. Cheers. Right, that was just, just us now. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. That was fantastic.